Hello, I'm Adam Fletcher, head of BHF Cymru. Welcome to today's BHF Live and Ticking event. These are our monthly online events where we share the latest BHF news and research stories with you. Um, and I'd like you to wel welcome you to today's event, which is part of the Swansea Science Festival. Um, and today we're going to be learning about abnormal heart rhythms. We're going to be joined by a researcher from Swansea University and also by a patient from South Wales. I'd just like to start off by um, reflecting on BHF's 60th birthday, um, which was this year, and just reflect on the power of science and how far we've come over the last 60 years because of BHF research. Thanks to our supporters and, and, and everyone who's, who's donated and fundraised for us over the last 60 years, BHF has funded some of the world's greatest cardiovascular breakthroughs research that has benefited people across Wales and, and across the whole world. And we should be really proud of that and we should celebrate that. If we think back to 60 years ago, when the BHF was, was founded, most people who had a heart attack, for example, didn't, didn't survive. And that's because doctors didn't know what caused heart attacks and they didn't have any effective treatments for people at that time. And it's only because of the, the research that BHF's funded the discoveries that, that we've made, the treatments that, that people have pioneered over the last 60 years, that today more than seven in 10 people survive a heart attack. And actually we want that to be nine in 10 people within the next decade. You know, there's lots of areas where BHF research has had a really transformational impact. And um, another example is, is around children with heart conditions. Um, children in Wales, across the UK, again, across the whole world, have benefited from BHF research, the discoveries we've made and, and, and the treatments that we've, we've pioneered. So that actually, you know, the life chances and the quality of life of, of those people with, living with congenital heart disease today has been completely transformed because of the power of that science. And today, BHF is the biggest independent funder of research into heart and circulatory disease in the UK, both, you know, both in Wales as well. Um, we fund over £3.8 million of research in Welsh universities at the moment, at Cardiff University and at Swansea University. And these researchers are all working on projects which are going to help us prevent and detect and treat heart and circulatory disease much more effectively in the future. And as well as the research we fund, the BHF Cymru team is here in Wales to make sure that everything we learn and the knowledge that we've generated through this research can be translated into Welsh government policy and to Welsh NHS practice as quickly as possible in order to benefit the 340,000 people in Wales living with heart and circulatory diseases today. And none of this work, none of the research we fund, none of the work we do with healthcare professionals in Wales would be possible um, without the Welsh public and our amazing supporters in Wales, everyone who volunteers for us, donates to BHF, fundraises for us, everyone who supports us, mm -hmm. powers the science that we're going to hear about today and the, and, and the impact of that on people's lives. So, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't exist without our supporters. So let's turn our attention to, to today's event. Um, I want to introduce firstly, Professor Chris George, who's a professor of molecular cardiology at Swansea University Medical School. And Chris is also the chair of the new National Cardiovascular Research Network for Wales. Chris and his team at Swansea research abnormal heart rhythms or arrhythmias, and he's going to talk about that research and the impact it has today. And we're also going to hear from Father of Free, Lee Manley from Cardiff. Lee um, has a condition called arrhythmogenic uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy, or ARVC for short. Um, and Lee's going to talk about his experience of that condition and also having um, an implantable defib. So I'd really like to thank Lee as well for his time um, today sharing his experiences. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Professor Chris George from Swansea University. Thanks very much, Adam, for that introduction. And uh, it's my pleasure to speak to everybody today um, about some of our research into inherited 
cardiac conditions. Uh, thank you for taking the time to, to tune in. And I think what I should start by introducing is some of the, the building blocks of heart muscle. Um, and here in cartoon form is the heart. And if we were to draw um, a kind of wire of muscle tissue out from the heart in cartoon form, it would look very much like a Lego assembly of cells, individual heart cells stitched together, connected into cable like structures. And there's a beautiful reason for this. This is to give heart muscle an electrical continuity through cables, through uh, channel-like activity, so that there is a connectedness of individual cells within the muscle as a whole. So billions of heart cells are effectively coupled to give one concerted rhythmic drive of heart muscle. And in this movie, which I'll play for you in a moment, this is in real time, a single heart cell. So let me remind you again that your heart is made up of billions of these cells, all beating synchronously because they're all connected. And you'll see that the way in which the heart cell contracts is end to end, and there's a very rhythmic synchronized beating of it. So if we think specifically, let me try and get rid of this, sorry. Uh, that every normal heart cell contraction has to be a, pre a precision event. And in this video here, I'll marry the physical contractility of a single heart cell with the signaling that happens within that cell that underlies every single contraction. And I'll remind you that where you see a green flash, scientifically, that's the release of an ion called a calcium ion from inside an intracellular store. And it's that event that is the trigger for heart muscle contraction. And under normal circumstances, it's beautifully organized, it's beautifully synchronized. The green flash leads to the muscle or the heart cell contracting. Under abnormal conditions, and here is an example of a heart cell that is failing, the synchronization of that flash is gone. There's effectively a wave of the calcium signal across the cell leading to this sort of contractile hiccup in the cell itself. The synchronization is gone and the contractility is destroyed. So there's a very clear disconnect in the normal and the failing heart cell between normal, very sharp calcium signals and in the failing cell, abnormal and very wave-like calcium signals. And that calcium release is mediated by a protein called the ryanodin receptor, which is the focus of our research. Apologies. And the ryanodin receptor has this beautifully organized architecture itself. And its job is to conduct calcium from inside the cellular store to outside the store, uh, a structure called the cytoplasm. And it's that metronomic release of calcium from the inside to the outside through the ryanodin receptor that underpins every heartbeat that you've ever had. If we take that channel and turn it towards ourselves, you can see again, there's a really uh, intrinsically ordered, beautiful ar architecture to the structure. And the calcium moves through this central pore, a little bit like a sawn off shotgun. And the rest of the molecule, this is a single molecule, just exists to control that tick of calcium through the channel. And in you, these channels are stitched together into something called a rays. They hold hands, they join up so that the connectivity of the channels ensures that the release of calcium is beautifully synchronized. And that's something that we saw in the preceding slide. So if we think about it a little bit more carefully, that what I've just outlined is the release of calcium from an intracellular store out into the cell. And it's this event that underpins every heartbeat that you've ever had. 
In terms of human biology, though, that process itself needs to be regulated by all of the other thousands of processes that are going on. And I think it's helpful here, I titled the slide sort of synchronizing the clocks, is that this is a process that needs to be absolutely matched to other processes that are going on in every other heart cell. So we think about the outflow of calcium from the store and the putting it back in, the sort of replenishment of the store. And scientifically, this is uh, known as the intracellular calcium clock. And that clock sits within a process called excitation contraction coupling, which is itself sensitive to regulation by other processes, including mitochondrial activity, surface ion fluxes, metabolism, cell death, protein synthesis and degradation, gene expression. Those processes need to be synchronized at the level of single cells, and those single cells need to be synchronized at the level of multi-cells. So you get the sense that that tick of calcium in the intracellular clock is regulated by a huge number of other processes, all of which know in space and time what's going on. And probably the most articulate way to illustrate this to you is just when you think of something that has an immutable beat rate, we most often think of metronomes. And what this video shows are five metronomes that are going to be launched out of phase with each other. And intuitively, you'd think that they would stay out of phase because they're metronomes. That's what metronomes do. They keep the beat. But through a physical process called multi-level coupling, you'll see what happens when five distinctly off-phase metronomes are synchronized using a multi-level coupling, which in this case is nothing more than a plank of wood and two Diet Coke cans. I'll remind you that they're metronomes. They keep the beat. And you can probably see that there's a slight vibration in the wood that's being transmitted through to a slight wobble in the cans of coke. And look what's happening to the metronomes. No matter how many times I watch videos like these, it always sort of amazes me that they're metronomes, they keep the beat. And if you put them together on a plank of wood and two coke hands, where you can establish the physical property of multi-level coupling, you'll synchronize those individual elements. And that's exactly how physically individual heart cells are synchronized at the levels of billions of them in the heart. So we can do these experiments. In this case, I'm illustrating it using mouse heart cells where we take one cell and we force them through a number of growth cycles so that they are physically touching, but functionally uncoupled. And we force them through again until they form contractile monolayers. And I'll just illustrate this with you. Again, the green flash is a calcium signal. In this instance, it's chaotic, it's noisy, it's relatively random. There is nothing really controlling that cell's behavior. But when they become physically coupled, although functionally uncoupled, you see they still have that sort of esoteric wildness to them. But then they go through this transition, much like the metronomes did, and you can form these beautifully contractile, synchronized monolayers in which the behavior of individual cells becomes the multicellular whole. So here you lose individual cell behavior, they become something called a syncytium. And that biologically is mirroring exactly the principles that happen when you put a metronome on a plank of wood and two coke cans. And it follows that if this is the way that synchronization is achieved in multicellular populations, that this process in reverse, this desynchronization, that is the root cause of human arrhythmia. 
It's the loss of coupling. It's the loss of electrical connectivity between cells within the myocardium, either in the ventricle or the atrium. So we wanted to move away from doing these sorts of experiments in mouse cells because mouse may not be entirely representative of the human situation. And we moved into human cells, in this case, networks of human stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. And really from a research perspective, this is the mainstay of our work today. This is cell networks built from human stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. You can say that they, under normal conditions, have these very, very sharp, very precise calcium snaps, and they pull themselves into fibers that orientate along A axes, and they effectively constitute mini hearts in a dish for the want of a better way to think about it. And the problem that we know and the problem that we're trying to tackle is that in human cardiac disease, these channels that I've talked about as being sort of nature's metronomes, they become leaky. And that really precise snap of open, close, open, close becomes leaky. And that leak sets up ectopic and aberrant beats, and it sets up a dysfunction of the intracellular signaling machinery, and it can have catastrophic uh, effects on cardiac rhythm and rate and contractility. So put simply in this cartoon is that disease-linked unraveling or unzipping of the protein that I've shown you in this talk leads to a disease-linked calcium leak. And so a therapeutic mainstay is to stabilize these channels back into the zipped up confirmation. And in order to probe this kind of mechanism, we're pushing the boundaries of what you can do with human cells in a dish, and we're engineering these cells in such a way that they have normal or abnormal levels of leakiness. And on the left-hand side here, we have a, uh, a large network of human cardiac cells where we can engineer them so that they have beautifully synchronized connected waveforms that go in a very linear direction. And this is entirely normal. This is entirely representative of the way that contractile waves will spread through your heart muscle normally. On the right hand side, we've done various experimental manipulations to destroy the linear nature of that wave, and we can produce spiral waves. And these sort of spiral waves are an absolute mimic of the sorts of waves that are characteristic of human arrhythmia, specifically reentrant waves. And because we know how we've transitioned normal human cells to the abnormal human cells, we can begin building models that predict whether or not that is more or less likely under various drug treatments and under various manipulations. So we've been able to build computer models that now step away from the use of human cells to begin predicting and modeling the breakdown of, of arrhythmic waves. So just to orientate you here is that these are not cells anymore. These are computational units where we can play with the connectivity and the interactions between each of these units. And when we do this, it's now entirely computationally possible to drive entirely normal cardiac-like conductive waves into waves of complete abnormality and spirals, which represent the chaotic state. And we know how we're doing this. We're doing it by numerically altering, not individual units, but the coupling between them. And that's a whole new era in being able to drug heart muscle back into the normal state. So I hope I've given you a very brief overview of some of the approaches that we're taking to develop new molecular, cellular and computer approaches to allow us to understand the mechanisms of normal rhythm and how that goes wrong in abnormal rhythm or arrhythmia. And more importantly, that we're beginning to poke at the boundaries of being able not just to see what's happening, but to be able to predict what will happen next. And of course, what we're trying to do is to transition from molecule through to man. We, we have a really good, probably a leading insight on what happens at the molecular level to cause arrhythmia. 
We understand how molecules are stitched together in signaling nodes. We know how those nodes are put together at the level of individual cardiac cells, how cardiac cells are connected together in multicellular networks, how those networks form heart tissue, how heart tissue is regulated within the confines of human physiology, the level of individuals. The real challenge for us is to take this knowledge into predictive models of how population um, arrhythmia events can be modeled, can be treated, can be diagnosed. And I think this is key as I hand over to Lee for the next talk, is that we are painfully aware of the need to develop new therapies because the armory that is there at the moment across the drug treatments, the device therapies, and also surgical techniques, they are excellent, but they're not entirely as optimal as they could be. And so the new therapeutic developments for treating arrhythmias can only come from new knowledge on the mechanisms of arrhythmia, like the sorts I've shown in this brief presentation. So it's clear that over the last 20, 25 years that we've done a huge amount, but there is still a vast amount that's left to do. And it's within this context that I really must thank the British Heart Foundation who have funded pretty much everything that you've seen over the last 10 minutes and for us, everything that we've done over the last 25 years. So thank you to the BHF um, and I'll hand over to Lee who is gonna give you a much more personal overview as somebody who has the lived experience of arrhythmia and the, the approaches that have been taken to manage his condition. And it's been my pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Chris. That was really, really, really useful insight. I think it just gives us a, just a glimpse of the, you know, the sort of the scale of the research which is going on at the moment to try and understand um, abnormal heart rhythms a little bit more and the, the type of the complexity of the work um, you're involved in and, 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 and how much, you know, how long that journey is in order to kind of translate that into, into patient benefit. And, and, and as you say, I think it'd be great to hear at this point um, from Lee about his experience of a patient and, and his experience of the treatments we have at the moment. So yeah, I'd really like to introduce uh, Lee Manley at this point. Thank you, Lee. Hi, thanks, Adam, and thank you, Chris, for that incredible presentation. Um, I certainly understand a little bit more um, about the way I've been in, impacted and some of the physiological um, experiences that uh, that I've I've encountered. So, um, a little bit of a brief introduction, really. Um, I'm 44 years old, uh, living in Cardiff, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, with my three daughters and uh, my, my wife Zoe. Um, and um, in 2016, I was uh, say 39 years of age, um, very fit, very active, um, had been so all my life really, since a child, always had, had, had a ball at my, at my feet or, or, or in my hands, and I think that's a uh, an important bit of perspective in the context of what went on to happen to me because uh, I think there's still a perception that um, people with heart um, conditions tend to be um, of the older generation and um, I, I, I still you know consider myself to be a, a, a relative youngster so um, at 39 years of age I certainly didn't expect to go to the gym one Saturday evening um, I've always run half marathons, 10Ks, um, and I must have been having a kind of midlife crisis because I'd taken up white collar boxing and I was, yeah, sort of trying to sort of um, just get the last throws of, uh, of youth out of my system. Um, when uh, about three kilometers into a pretty standard run, I would regularly run six miles um, pretty, pretty comfortably. Um, I just felt as if I was one minute connected to the grid and the next minute it was like the pot, the, the socket had been, uh, sorry, the plug had been pulled from the socket. And certainly you and Chris there talking about uh, the electrical impulses uh, makes, a, makes a, a lot of sense to me. Um, and I found myself on the treadmill wrestling with my own consciousness for what felt like a lot longer than it probably was. And before I know it, it's lights out and um, you know my my life really from that point onward has sort of turned on a on a sixpence um, 
I was very fortunate the evening that I that I collapsed in that there were um, some um, other um, gym goers who put me into the recovery position and called the paramedics. Um, I was also lucky in that I was breathing throughout the, 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 the process. Um, and uh, two or three minutes later, I did come round um, something obviously really stabilised with, within me, but it did start a, um, a series of investigation, really. Uh, the paramedics took all my vitals on arrival and everything was normal. Um, and even though I'd had this really strange experience, nothing, I'd never been symptomatic in any shape or form before. And as I say, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd often done a lot of running and I kind of like was wondering, well, what, what's going on? Um, but, you know, is there anything to really worry about? The paramedics sent me away with sort of, well, I drove home from the gym, which, t which tells, you, tells you a lot. But when I, when I did get back home, um, I went to go for a shower and I realised I'd lost control of my bowels. And I think that was the point at which I really appreciated that something quite uh, significant had happened. And it started a, a chain of events whereby um, I went to the GPs and was referred to a cardiologist. Um, and given that the, the topic of the sort of chat is abnormal heart rhythms, I think it's important to understand that my actual condition, ARVC, was not um, a simple thing to, to diagnose, far from it. Um, some of my ECGs at rest were initially showing up as um, quite normal. Um, talked them through my story, then we had some um, echocardiograms done. Um, and then a, a, a kind of um, a stress test, but only to the point in which I maybe felt some sort of symptoms. And um, I thought I felt a bit lightheaded. And, and I do put the emphasis on the word thought, because sometimes your mind plays tricks with you. And I was like, did I feel something? Did I not? But it coincided with um, just seeing a, 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 an abnormality on, on the, uh, on the um, ECG reading. So um, there were more um, tests then. Um, they, they, they sort of identified what had originally looked like a reasonably normal echocardiograph. They, they noticed a slight dilation in the right ventricle then. Um, it was an MRI scan that preceded that, which revealed there was some scar tissue then in the right ventricle. Um, quite a small amount by all accounts. And I remember the description on some of the, um, the forms I had back was described it as patchy. But we were starting to build a picture. Um, and I think that was the thing, there's no sort of single diagnosis, but there was a starting point and like a jigsaw, they were putting all the pieces um, of that jigsaw together. Um, and then I went for a, 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 an additional um, stress test where the cardiologist had told me he was going to push me to my limits. And by this point, I was on um, some medication, um, but I was asked to come off that sort of 48 hours prior to the test so they was kind of they could take a real look at what was going on and um still to this day i'm absolutely staggered given what has happened to me since that i managed to sort of um run for i think it was 16 minutes on an uphill program i got to the end of the program and i thought this is great um the drugs are working there's nothing really to worry about here i'll get my driving license back um because i've been told that uh I shouldn't drive, and that felt like an eternity at the time, even though it was only sort of three or four months from recollection. And uh, when I went back to the cardiologist, um, it was a week later, and he sat me down, and it was the only time I didn't go with my wife. I was that confident that, you know, everything was in good work in order. And he sat me down, he said, look, um, this is a normal ECG. This is you at the start, he said, um, of your exercise. Um, the um, exercise can sometimes suppress some arrhythmias in, in, in the initial phases and look it's normal. And by the end, he sort of talked me through, by the end of um, the, 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 the bit of ECG paper, I guess the printout, the look that coincided with the time of being in the, uh, on the treadmill, it was like a child had just scribbled over a bit of paper. There was waves just everywhere. Um, and he said to me, and this is you, after you stopped, um, in the recovery period, your heart rate went up to 240 beats per minute. You were sat there talking to me, um, and he said, you shouldn't really have even been conscious. And he said, I'm afraid to say you've got a serious and life-threatening um, arrhythmia here. And at that point, they still couldn't be categoric that it was ARVC. Um, it had kind of... Um, there were a lot of different potential diagnoses on the table and um, but the one thing that was certain at that point is that I'd need an ICD fitted to give me that ultimate level of protection um, and within two weeks I had that 
inserted. Um, and uh, two days prior to that, they did get me in for a biopsy as well. Um, and the results of that weren't available until the following April. The, the, the tissues had to go off to a lab in Oxford. And when it came back then, I remember it sort of um, cited in evidence of fibrosis, uh, which was consistent potentially with, 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 with ARVC. Um, so, you know, that, 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 that was the diagnosis. And I think at that point, I probably envisaged that, oh, I've got my, you know, I've got a set of medication now. Um, I was originally on bisoprolol and flecainide, um, and the doses have, have, have varied over time. So um, I can't even remember what I was originally on, but suffice to say they were smaller and they've increased over the passage of time um, because um, I guess it's just been a really um, rocky road um, over the last three or four years for me since. Um, I've had a numerous um, admittances to hospital, sort of just where my heart rate will um, just 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 peak for, 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 no, for, for no apparent reason. I'm not even exercising sometimes, sat at my desk at work, sat at home. Um, but my, and I was very difficult to, um, a very difficult patient, I think, in terms of um, reaching a point where they wanted to do a surgical intervention because the, the cardiologist I was seeing wanted to get to the point where um, I was having a sustained tachycardia because they did originally go in and do um, an attempted ablation, but I had so many different arrhythmias going off within my right ventricle that they didn't know um, which area of the heart to have effectively burn and smooth out the scar tissue to allow for the electrical impulses to, 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 to flow. So I was a little bit of a sitting duck for a while and I'd feel terrible, you know, when I was having these um, episodes of um, ventricular tachycardia. Um, so where am I, where am I going with this? Um, I guess it's sort of, uh, it's probably important to say how this has uh, affected my life to date and what are the successes that I've achieved and what, what um, amount to um, I owe to, to research and I owe my life really. Um, if I start with the ICD, um, you know, I'm fully aware that 25, 30 years ago, uh, people in my situation didn't have this option. The technology was in its infancy um and it's come an awful long way and you know that's my last line of defense and whilst you never want to use it and um i have had to rely on it um sort of early 2020 um, I, I got shocked a number of times um and it wasn't pleasant but the alternative for my family is is, un, is unbearable um medication i'm on as i said it's, it's varied over the years i've sort of fluctuated from sort of um two and a half milligrams of bisoprol and currently on seven and a half milligrams at one point while I was waiting for surgery um, in late 2019 I was on 20 milligrams which just to put into context when I first got uh, put onto 10 milligrams of the drug they told me that I was the maximum dose so when I got put onto 20 milligrams I was like well how can I be on double the maximum dose and it was just a way to um, slow everything down the side effects were pretty debilitating I was always fatigued um, and um, it, it, it wasn't a great time if, 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 if I'm honest um, but it was it, it, it was absolutely necessary to get me to the 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 the, the, the theater really where I could have um, further catheter ablation um, and this time to the outside of the heart which was quite a complex procedure but in a nutshell um, the medication um, I guess Chris has alluded to it uh, better than I ever ever could in, in, in terms of the research. But these drugs that I am now benefiting from, whilst there, there may well be some distance left, left to travel, um, they're, they're keeping me here and giving me a decent quality of life. Now I've had some more surgical interventions, which brings me on to the, to the surgery. I mentioned their catheter um, ablation. So I've had it twice um, for, um, twice into the right ventricle. Um, say the second time I had to go to Liverpool for um, quite a lengthy procedure, which interestingly um, was, 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 was pioneering surgery developed in South America and has been sort of brought over here. So again, the, 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 ben, I'm the beneficiary of, of research into something that didn't exist even sort of five or 10 years ago, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I remember being explained to me. Um, 
and and then just as, as if matters couldn't get worse, I did develop atrial fibrillation on top of the ventricular tachycardia after I'd um, had my surgeries in um, early 2020. But again, I was able to benefit from cryoablation then um, into the atrium, and that stabilised everything. And I, I, I am sort of you know it's a case of touch wood, but I'm 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 the best I've been since diagnosis now, um, and. I didn't really feel I'd get to the stage. There were dark moments where I just thought my life, my life would never get back to any sort of perceived normality. Um, but physically, I am in the, the 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 best shape I've been since since I collapsed. Okay, I, I was told at the very outset I would never exercise again in terms of sort of um, intense uh, of any intensity. So no running. I was told the most would probably be a game of golf. But it's amazing what you can. Uh, you know what you what you can benefit from and how um, the simple things in life are the things that matter so I just you know really enjoy taking the dog for a walk now but all of those things are only possible through the the, the, the research the British Heart Foundation have done which is why I try to do all that I can to support the the, the, the the charity I mean I can't go out and do the marathons anymore and raise money in in that sense but um, what I can do is um, try and raise awareness of the number of people that affects tell my story um, and, and I think something that sort of really hit home to me when we were planning for this session is that um, we're at a stage at the moment in terms of interventions where it's restorative care, but hopefully the likes of the work that Chris is doing can lead to sort of curative interventions in the future. So, you know, that really does fill me with hope that the research will one day lead to something even more significant in terms of treatment and, and, and hopefully even cure. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's it from uh, me right now and hopefully that's some insight for everyone into uh, into ARVC in particular. Thank you so much Lee, it's such um, a powerful story, you know it just illustrates perfectly you know why British Heart Foundation existed, you know you know why we why we've got so much more we need to do over the next 60 years um, such a challenge and yeah thank you for sharing thank you for sharing that story um i suppose what i've, I've got some questions that people have, have, have submitted and one question which we've kind of touched on there um that someone asked is about what will the patient outcomes of um professor chris george and, and, and his team's work be and lee touched on some of that at the end chris i wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit more about how we sort of bridge that translational gap yeah, thanks, Adam. So, so Lee puts it extremely well. That at the moment, um, the the option is is restorative. Uh, we would like the treatments to lead to being preventative, um, and that needs us to better understand the evolution of disease. How do you go from normal to abnormal? You know, Lee has outlined really quite beautifully there at the age of thirty nine he became almost lethally abnormal. Now, where, where did that come from? Was that a kind of life leading up to that? Was that a kind of pivotal moment that something unusual happened? The answer is that we don't know. But what we can do is to use basic laboratory research to pull and push and tease and tug at the seams of these mechanisms to see how, um, how can we better predict how normal becomes abnormal. And I think our focus for the next how, however many decades is going to be on prevention and being truly curative rather than therapeutic. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really inspiring to kind of hear, hear that vision. And I think, yeah, that, that's what should, should motivate us all. Another, another question that we've had sent in, which I think is a really interesting one is, what is the difference between an irregular heart rhythm and an abnormal heart rhythm? Are, the, are these interchangeable terms or are they different? Oh, that's that's a great question. It's, it's one I get asked a lot, is that to a certain extent, all of our heart rhythms have a degree of irregularity about it. It's part of the biological way in which it's wired. And I think if you cast your mind back to that movie of the metronomes, 
there are definitely phases as they become totally synchronized where they're not. And there is an inbuilt, there has to be biologically, a little bit of flexibility on the edges to give sometimes some irregularity. Lee mentions about exercise, you know, and under exercise conditions, your heart rate could potentially double. And the only way you can achieve that is if you have a, uh, an element of irregularity that can kind of accommodate change. So irregularity is, is astonishingly common and is a feature of the normal heart. That's distinctly different from an abnormal heart rhythm where the irregularity is just wrong. And it's that discriminator between normal irregularity and abnormal disease-linked irregularity. That's usually the sign of clinical diagnoses in, in making that call. That's great. Thank you, Chris. Um, one of the questions we've had in view, Lee, is, is, is just about you know, how the conditions impacted on you and your family's life and, and how you found having an, an implantable defib. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Looks like we've lost uh, Lee for a minute there. Okay, while we wait for uh, the the lead to rejoin us. I've got um, another question for you, actually, Chris, which has been uh, emailed in from Janet. And she says, I've been diagnosed with bigemony because of uh, bisoprolol. I'm classed as AF. Can you explain the difference if there is one? Um, so thank you, Janet, for that. Um, so bigemony is, as the name suggests, um, two twins, it's two beats, normally when there should be one. So you have an, a normal beat followed by something that technically is called a PVC, a premature ventricular complex, which is effectively an early abnormal beat. And that's usually in the ventricle. So that is an electrical contractile defect of the, of the ventricle, which from your question, you also have AF which is atrial. So that's arrhythmia in the atrial chamber and a bigemony is an abnormal patterning in the ventricle chamber. So categorically, they are different things. They're different manifestations. That's great. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I'd just like to thank both Chris and Lee um, for their time today and, and, and thank everyone who's kind of joined um, this live and ticking event. Um, it's been brilliant, brilliant to have you both, and um, you know it's great to continue continue to contribute to uh, Swansea Science Festival this year. So thank you.